During my junior year of college, I took a month-long sports ethics course in Australia. It was my first time leaving the United States, and as a good Division III tennis player, I was most excited about spending a week at the Australian Open, one of tennis's four Grand Slam tournaments. Without watching the number one doubles team in the world, the Bryan brothers, my friend Callie leaned over to me and said, hey, someday that could be you out there. Nah, I said, it doesn't really work like that. But she persisted. She said, but aren't you one of the best players in our school? And isn't our school one of the best programs in all of Division Three? Sure, I said, that's true. But pro tennis players are picked to be pros at a young age. They grow up at tennis academies. Only a handful of college tennis players will even try their hand at professional tennis. And they come from schools like Virginia, Florida, Texas, USC, UCLA. I play for Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. And D3 players don't go pro. I was, and still am, a realist. I was just cal telling Callie the truth. I didn't think I'd ever be back in Melbourne as a player because I wasn't good enough. Even as a kid, I always chose to set short-term goals, have realistic things that I could achieve. I was lucky to have a mentor help build this base for me. When I went to Gustavus, my tennis coach, Steve Wilkinson, had a simple yet profound philosophy. Focus on the things that you can control. Things like giving full effort or being a good sport. As the number two player on the team, when I started with him, I was totally consumed with the idea of getting to number one. And one time after practice, he pulled me aside and said, Eric, this whole thing, it's about so much more than you playing one, two, three, six. It's about you becoming the best player that you can be. I bought into the philosophy. My sophomore year, I got to number one on the team. I went on to the national championships and made it all the way to the finals. The following year, I returned as the number one player in the country. But I also started embracing some new experiences. I had my first girlfriend. I joined a fraternity. <laughs> I learned the bar specials at all of the hotspots in town. So when we got to nationals that year, as the top-seeded team, we played Emory in the semifinals. And the match got to three all, and I was the last one on court. I got to a tiebreaker in the third set, and I lost. I learned a couple things that day. One, regret sucks. There was five seniors on that team who worked so hard and deserved a national championship. And because of my performance, they didn't get it. I also learned that I had set a goal of winning the national championship, but I didn't do all the things every day to set myself up to perform well there. So when I met with my coach in the summer and the fall season, my senior year, we set daily goals. I monitored things after every practice, like my head, my heart, my lungs, and we would scale them from one to 10 as to how well I performed in that practice. I would do early morning workouts with him a few days a week to make sure I didn't go out. I would do extra fitness work so I knew when long matches happened, I would be prepared for them. When the Nationals came around my senior year, I was totally relaxed. I knew that I'd done everything to prepare myself for that tournament. And if I lost, I was going to be OK with that. I went on to win the singles and doubles that year. So what do you do when you're the best player in Division III college tennis? I said earlier, D3 players don't go pro. I was lucky to be approached by my now best friend, a free-spirited Aussie named Gareth, who lived by the mantra I'll sleep when I'm dead. He wanted me to move to France with him, to join another Hazi, and go from small town to small town playing money tournaments. He said that there's a weekend club tennis league where they pay you a couple hundred euros to compete. Under any other circumstances, I would have easily dismissed this opportunity and continued on my path to being a high school social studies teacher. But I liked Gareth. And I didn't want to quit playing tennis just because my collegiate career was ending. 
I knew I was still getting better. Moving to France was never about attaining a certain ranking or even making any money. It was never about making it. I was setting simple goals. Things like learning to slide on the European red clay, trying to learn 10 new French words each day, trying to find a small town supermarket that might be open on Sundays. Not possible. <laughs> and those first months were hard. We had some rough experiences. I played a match in the northern tip of France, lost, drove 10 hours to the Spanish border to play another event that started that same day, only to lose again in the first round. I spent a full week sleeping on a wooden bench in the shower area of a tournament locker room. I regularly ate plain pasta with ketchup, because that was what I could afford. I found myself often asking myself the question, what are you doing with your life? But throughout all this, my two friends and I were continuing to hone our skills. We coached each other, we tracked our progress, and I was learning to really enjoy that process, the daily struggle to get better. 18 months, yeah, about 12 longer than I expected to be playing, I won my first ATP ranking point in Barnstaple, England. I won 230 British pounds, and I was ranked 1,461 in the world. <laughs> For a frame of reference, the top 100 players get invited to Wimbledon. At 1461, still had a long way to go. But so many of the players that I talked with at that stage of my tour felt defeated. These guys had aspirations of being number one in the world, winning a grand slam. Parents, friends have been telling them since a young age they were gonna do great things in the sport. So they were failing. But because of how I presented it, I was succeeding just by playing and improving. And now I was the only Division III tennis player with the world ranking. The emails, the congratulatory emails were flowing in by the tens. <laughs> but I used that, like, I used that energy. I became inspired more than ever. I fed off it. I became totally consumed with my tennis game. Each day, each practice, I wanted to leave the court 1% better than before. I worked on the little nuances, not just forehands and backhands, but I would hit basket after basket of second serves while tracking my percentages in a notepad to make sure that they were better than the week before. Years followed with similarly small steps until 2007, four years after I made that initial move to France, when I walked out to compete on the hallowed grounds of Wimbledon. That was the point when all of the outsiders felt that I had made it. But I had a secret. With these small goals, realistic dreams, I'd been making it every single day. A year later, to my surprise, I was nominated and elected to serve on the ATP Player Council, tennis's version of a player's union. In this council, there's 10 players voted to represent the player's interests things like negotiate prize money, help work on the schedule. And in the group that I joined were some of the game's greats. Roger Federer, Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic. As a new player on tour, I hadn't even spoken to these guys. So sitting around a boardroom table, more or less as an equal, was a really intimidating experience. But I decided to use that same blueprint that was working on the court and apply it to my council life. I worked hard. I met with the directors of tournaments. I would invite other players who I didn't know that well out to dinner so I could listen to their concerns and then negotiate on their behalf. After six years as president, Roger Federer stepped down and I was elected to take over. Now, not only was this never my dream when I started this, but it would have been ridiculous to think that the greatest player in the history of our sport would feel comfortable passing the torch to a low-ranked doubles player. 13 years after that initial conversation with my classmate, I was back in Melbourne, and this time it was to play my eighth consecutive Australian Open. 
my opponents that day in the third round, the still world number one ranked Brian brothers. Callie had been right. Someday that would be me. It was me. We went on to win that match and make the finals that year. Of the four finalists, I don't know if I was the only one that never really dreamed of being there. But I do know that I was the only one to attend that event as a fan in his 20s. So I pose the question to you. When you think about something you want to achieve, how far out is that goal? Is it something that you can actually control? Could you achieve it tomorrow? At the 2016 US Open, I retired from professional tennis. I took a job on the business side of the sport, working for the USTA. So I'm no longer returning 130 mile an hour serves, but I'm taking on new challenges. Things like figuring out the intricacies of Microsoft Excel, <laughs> strategizing around who I'm going to CC and BCC on each email, <laughs> performing my first TED Talk. For some people, big dreams do work well but they paralyze others. For the realists out there, like me, small goals, achievable dreams, are the key to a successful day. And enough of those days translate into one great life full of achievement. But here's the real secret. If you take this tactic, not only can you achieve great things, but you can live a happier life. You won't be experiencing that feeling of failure. You won't be burning yourself out trying to move six spots ahead with your every move. Instead, you'll feel accomplished and empowered. So I urge you to go ahead and try to dream small because you just might win big. <laughs>